shall we? All right. So the first of the four stories is called, appropriately enough, the Sneetches. Now, <clears throat> the star-bellied Sneetches had bellies with stars. The plain-bellied Sneetches had none upon theirs. Those stars weren't so big, they really were so small, you might think such a thing wouldn't matter at all. And can you see the stars? But because they had stars, all the star belly sneeches would brag, we are the best kind of sneech on the beaches. With their snoots in the air, they would sniff and they'd snort, we'll have nothing to do with the plain bellied sort. And whenever they met some, when they were out walking, they'd hike right on past them without even talking. When the star belly children went out to play ball, could a plain belly get in the game? Not at all. You could only play if your bellies had stars and plain belly children had none upon theirs. When the star belly sneeches had Frankfurter roasts or picnics or parties or marshmallow toasts, they never invited the plain bellied sneeches. They left them out cold in the dark of the beaches. They kept them away, never let them come near, and that's how they treated them year after year. Then one day, it seems, while the plain belly sneeches were moping and doping alone on the beaches, just sitting there, wishing their bellies had stars, a stranger zipped up in the strangest of cars. My friends, he announced in a voice clear and keen, my name is Sylvester McMonkey McBean, and I've heard of your troubles, I've heard you're unhappy, but I can fix that, I'm the fix it up chappy. I've come here to help you, I have what you need, my prices are low, and I, my work I can work at great speed, and my work is 100% guaranteed. Then quickly, Sylvester McMonkey McBean put together a very peculiar machine. And he said, you want stars like a star belly sneech? My friends, you can have them for just $3 each. Just pay me your money and hop right aboard. So they clamored inside, then the big machine roared, and it clonked, and it bonked, and it jerked, and it burked, and it bopped them about, but the thing really worked. When the plain belly sneeches popped out, they had stars. They actually did. They had stars upon theirs. Then they yelled at the ones who had stars at the start, we're exactly like you, you can't tell us apart. We're all just the same now, you snooty old smarties. And now we can go to your Frankfurter parties. Good grief, groaned the ones who had stars at the first. We're still the best sneeches and they're still the worst. But now how in the world will we know, they all frowned, if which kind is what or the other way round. And up came McBean with a very sly wink. And he said, things are not quite as bad as you think. So you don't know who's who, that's perfectly true. But come with me, friends. Do you know what I'll do? I'll make you, again, the best sneeches on the beaches and it will only cost you $10 eaches. Belly stars are no longer in style, said McBean. What you need is a trip through my star off machine. This wondrous contraption will take off your stars so you won't look like sneeches who have them upon bars. And that handy machine worked very precisely, removed all the stars from their tummies quite nicely. Then, with snoots in the air, they paraded about, and they opened their beaks and they let out a shout. We know who is who, now there is no doubt. The best kind of sneeches are sneeches without. Then of course, those with stars got frightfully mad. To be wearing a star now was frightfully bad. 
Then, of course, old Sylvester McMonkey McBean invited them into his star off machine. Then, of course, from then on, as you probably guess, things got really into a horrible mess. All the rest of that day on those wild screaming beaches, the fix it up chappy kept fixing up sneeches off again, on again, in again, out again. Through the machines, they raced round and about again, changing their stars every two minutes or minute or two. They kept paying money. They kept running through until neither the plane nor the star bellies knew whether this one was that one or th that one was this one or which one was what one or what one was who. Then, when every last cent of their money was spent, the fix-it-up chappy packed up and he went, and he laughed as he drove in his car up the beach. They never will learn. No, you can't teach a sneech. But McBean was quite wrong. I'm quite happy to say that the sneeches got really quite smart on that day, the day they decided that sneeches are sneeches, and no kind of sneech is the best on the beaches. That day, all the sneeches forgot about stars and whether they had one or not upon theirs. That was a pretty good one. Now, the second story in this Dr. Seuss collection is called The Zacks. I really enjoyed this one when I was your age. One day, making tracks, in the prairie of Prax, came a north-going Zax and a south-going Zax. Say hi, do And it happened that both of them came to a place where they bumped, there they stood, foot to foot, face to face. Look here now, the north-going Zax said. I say, you're blocking my path. You're right in my way. I'm a north-going Zax, and I always go north. Get out of my way now, and let me go forth. Who's in whose way, snapped the south-going Zax. I always go south, making south-going tracks, so you're in my way, and I ask you to move, and let me go south in my south-going groove. Then the north-going Zax, popped up his chest with pride. I never, he said, take a step to one side, and I'll prove to you that I won't change my ways if I have to keep standing here 59 days. And I'll prove to you, yelled the south-going Zax, that I can stand here in the prairie of Prax for 59 years for I live by a rule that I learned as a boy back in South going school, never budge. That's my rule, never budge in the least, not an inch in, to the west, not an inch to the east. I'll stay here not budging. I can and I will if it makes you and me and the whole world stand still. Oh my. What do you think they're gonna do? Let's find out. Well, of course, the world didn't stand still. The world grew. In a couple of years, the new highway came through, and they built it right over those two stubborn zacks and then left them there, standing unbudged in their tracks. Like that one. So this story is a, is a short one, and it's called Too Many Babes. Too many what, Daves? Too yeah. many Daves, that's right. Did I ever tell you that Mrs. McCabe had 23 sons and she named them all Dave? Well, she did, and that wasn't a smart thing to do. You see, when she wants one and she calls out you who Come to the house, Dave. She doesn't get one. All 23 Daves of hers come on the run. That's just silly.
This makes things quite difficult at the McCaves, as you can imagine with so many Daves. And often she wishes that when they were born, she'd named one of them Bodkin Van Horn, and one of them Who's Foos, and one of them Snim, and one of them Hotshot, and one Sunny Jim, and one of them Shadrach, and one of them Grinky, and one of them Stuffy, and one of them Stinky, and one of them Putt Putt, another one Moonface, another one Marvin or Double Balloon Face, and one of them Ziggy, and one Soggy Muff, and one Buffalo Bill, and one Buffalo Buff and one of them Sneepy, and one Weepy Weed, and one Paris Garters, and one Harris Tweed, and one of them Sir Michael Carmichael Zut, and one of them Oliver Bolliver Butt, and one of them Zanzibar Buck Buck McFate, but she didn't do it, and now it's too late. And I invite you to try to read that without making a mistake. <laughs> All right, the fourth of the stories is called, What Was I Scared Of? Well, I was walking in the night and I saw nothing scary, for I have never been afraid of anything, not very. Then I was deep within the woods when suddenly I spied them. I saw a pair of pale green pants with nobody inside them. I wasn't scared, but yet I stopped. What could those pants be there for? Uh, it's all right. could a pair of pants at night be standing in the air for? You see the pants in the corner there? Right there. And then they moved, those empty pants. They kind of started jumping. And then my heart, I must admit, it kind of started thumping. So I got out, I got out fast, as fast as I could, sir. But I wasn't scared. But pants like that, I didn't care for, no, sir. Would you be care uh, scared of pants that were chasing you? Yeah. After that week, a week went by. Then one night in Gidditch, I had to do an errand there and fetch some Greenwich spinach. Well, I had fetched the spinach. I was starting back through town when those pants raced round a corner. They almost knocked me down. I lost my Greenwich spinach, but I didn't care. I ran for home, believe me. I had a real scare. Now, bicycles were never made for pale green pants to ride them, especially spooky pale green pants with nobody inside them. And next night, I was fishing for doubt trout on River River when those pants came rowing toward me. Well, I started to shiver. And by now I was so frightened that I'll tell you, but I hate to, I screamed and rode away and lost my hook and line and bait too. I ran and found a brickle bush and hid myself away. I got brickles in my britches, but I stayed there anyway. I stayed all night, the next night too. I'd be there still, no doubt. Anyway, well, I had an errand. So the next night, I went out. I had to do an errand. Had to pick up a peck of snide in a dark and gloomy snide field, almost nine miles wide. I said, I do not fear those pants with nobody inside them. I said and said and said those words. I said them, but I lied them. Then I reached inside a snide bush, and the next thing that I knew, I felt my hand touch someone, and I'll bet that you know who. And there I was, caught in the snide in that dreadful place, those spooky empty pants and I were standing face to face. I yelled for help, I screamed, I shrieked, I howled, I yelled, I cried. Oh, save me from these pale green pants with nobody inside. But then a strange thing happened. Why, those pants began to cry. Those pants began to tremble. 
They were just as scared as I. I never heard such whimpering, and I began to see that I was just as strange to them as they were strange to me. I put my arm around their waist and sat right down beside them. I calmed them down, poor empty pants, with nobody inside them. And now we meet quite often, those empty pants and I, and we never shake or tremble. We both smile and we say, hi. Now that's the story of Sneetches and the other story. story. Now, by a show of thumbs, how many would like me to read one more story? Yeah, would everyone like one more? Okay, don't tell anyone though. I'm gonna read one that I really enjoyed and remember well, it's called Caps for Sale. How many of you have ever heard Caps for Sale? Give me a thumbs up. Oh, wonderful, okay. Special treat tonight, Caps for Sale. A two for one evening, okay. So it's called Caps for Sale, a tale of a peddler, some monkeys, and their monkey business. And this book was actually written in 1940. So it's a very old story. Once there was a peddler who sold caps, but he was not like an ordinary peddler carrying his wares on his back. He carried them on the top of his head. First, he had his own checkered cap, then a bunch of gray caps, then a bunch of brown caps, then a bunch of blue caps, and on the very top, a bunch of red caps. Just look at that. Look at all the caps. Okay. He walked up and down the streets, holding himself very straight so as not to upset his caps. As he walked along, he called, caps, caps for sale, 50 cents a cap. One morning, he couldn't sell any caps. He walked up the street and he walked down the street calling caps, caps for sale, 50 cents a cap. But nobody wanted any caps that morning. Nobody wanted even a red cap. He began to feel very hungry, but he had no money for lunch. I think I'll go for a walk in the country, he said. And he walked out of town slowly, slowly, so as not to upset his caps. You see him walking there? He walked for a, a long time until he came to a, a great big tree. That's a nice place for a rest, he thought. He sat down very slowly under the tree and leaned back little by little against the tree trunk so as not to disturb the caps on his head. Then he put up his hand, he put his hand to, his, to feel if they were straight. First, he checked his own cap, then the gray caps, then the brown caps, the blue caps, and the red caps on the very top. Does he look comfortable? I think he looks comfortable. They were all there, so he went to sleep. He slept for a very long time. When he woke up, uh, he was refreshed and rested. Does anyone see anything wrong here? Yeah, yeah. But before standing up, he felt with his hand to make sure his caps were in the right place. All he felt was his own checkered cap. He looked to the right of him, no caps. He looked to the left of him, no caps. He looked in back of him, no caps. He looked behind the tree. No caps. Then he looked up into the tree. And what do you think he saw? On every branch sat a monkey. On every monkey was a gray or a brown or a blue or a red cap.
The peddler looked at the monkeys. The monkeys looked at the peddler. He didn't know what to do. Finally, he spoke to them. You monkeys, you, he said, shaking a finger at them. You give me back my caps. But the monkeys only shook their fingers back at him and said, tit, 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 tit. This made the peddler angry, so he shook both his hands at them and said, you monkeys, you, you give me back my caps. But the monkeys only shook both their hands at him and said, sit, 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 sit. Now he felt quite angry. He stamped his foot and he said, you monkeys, you, you better give me back my caps. But the monkeys only stamped their feet back at him and said, zit, 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 zit. But this time, this time, the peddler was really very, very angry. He stamped both his feet and shouted, you monkeys, you, you must give me back my caps. But the monkeys only stamped both their feet back at him and said, zit, 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 zit. What's he gonna do? At last, he became so angry that he pulled off his own cap and he threw it to the ground and began to walk away. Can you guess what happens? But then each monkey pulled off his cap And all the gray caps, and all the brown caps, and all the blue caps, and all the red caps came flying down out of the tree. So the peddler picked up his caps and put them back on his head, first his own checkered cap, then the gray caps, then the brown caps, then the blue caps, and then the red caps on the very top. And slowly, slowly, he walked back to town calling, caps for sale, caps for sale, 50 cents a cap. That was the story of caps for sale. Well, I hope you enjoyed our bedtime story uh, tonight. And we're going to do this at the same time next week, uh, Monday at 6.30. I hope you'll all join me then, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.